commercial space flight is really important to the piece of the puzzle in that the more operations that we can turn over to commercial activities in low Earth orbit, uh, the SpaceX's, you know, all, the, all of these uh, other outfits, then the more that frees up the large government space agencies. That's retired NASA astronaut Ron Garin. He is talking about Elon Musk's company, SpaceX, that just landed a reusable rocket on a barge off the Florida coast for the second time. SpaceX, they are practicing for a Mars landing, which it is hoping to achieve within two years. Its ultimate goal is to have a colony on the red planet. Amazing. Now, Garin himself, he is also amazing. He's in the private sector now, but he is chief pilot for a company called Worldview Enterprises. Worldview, they plan to use a giant balloon to send people into the stratosphere for a tidy 75,000 bucks. You yourself can make the trip. Garin, who is a Yonkers native and a Roosevelt High School graduate, he was just honored by his alma mater and placed onto its wall of fame. Our senior political producer, Karen McBride, she just caught up with Garin at the Yonkers Riverfront Library that was also honoring him. Ron, you've received a number of recognitions throughout your amazing career, a career that literally took you around the globe. And today you've come back to your hometown. You're being recognized by your high school, Roosevelt, here in Yonkers. What does that feel like to come back to your roots? Oh, wow. It's, uh, it's really amazing. It's always good to come home. Uh, always good to, to come back to the place where you got your start, where you learned those lessons that you carried through adulthood and, and shaped you into the, into the adult uh, that you are. So it's, uh, it's great to be home. And have you come back before to any of your high school reunions? Because certainly you would have some unique bragging rights. <laughs> yes, I have been back to, to reunions and I've been back to football games and, and other events uh, over the years. Ron, the burning question from someone who is grounded is what was it like the first time you were in space seeing Earth? Yeah, that was a, that was really a remarkable moment uh, when I got to re you know really look out the window and look back at our planet and um, I mean it was it was indescribably beautiful. I mean it was breathtaking. Um, but I think the first thing that hit me was just how thin the atmosphere is. And it's something I fully expected. I mean I've seen hundreds or if not thousands of photographs of the Earth, and I had friends who had come back and said, you're, you're just going to be amazed at how thin the atmosphere was. But until I saw it with my own eyes, um, you know, it was really sobering to think that that paper-thin layer, and that's w what it is, it really looks like just a, a sheet of paper was wrapped around the planet. That's our atmosphere. And that, that layer is the only thing keeping every living thing on our planet alive. And you said that seeing Earth from space changed your perspective. It made you think about some of the challenges that we have here and why we can't solve them. Yeah, I mean, one of the things when you look back at our planet and you're, and you're looking at this beautiful scene, one of the things that you're hit with is the, is the sobering contradiction between the beauty of our planet on one hand and then the unfortunate realities of life on our planet on the other hand. And I, you know, when I looked back at the Earth, I would routinely, you know, ponder you know, why does it have to be that way? And I was, I'm was one of these people that had, I launched into space with this belief that we are, already have all the resources, all the technology necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. So I spent a good time of my, you know, my moments earth gazing, pondering the question, if that's true, why do they still remain? And I think one of the main reasons why we still face so many critical issues and what really dawned on me during a spacewalk uh, was when I looked down at the International Space Station and, you know, this amazing, enormous complex, you know, probably the most complicated complex structure ever built. What hit me was that 15 nations came together. Some of these nations weren't always the best of friends. Some were on opposite sides of the Cold War, opposite sides of the space race, and somehow they found a way to set aside their differences and work together towards this common goal. And I thought to myself, you know, what would the world look like if we could have that same level of collaboration, that same level of cooperation here on the Earth's surface? When you're out there, is there anything that scares you? A spacewalk is inherently scary, so <laughs> everything about a spacewalk <laughs> scared me. Uh, I would think so. But uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Uh, and so I, I did uh, four spacewalks over the course of my, my two missions. Um, and it's the most incredible thing I could ever imagine doing, uh, to be out there in the vacuum of space. The only thing separating you from the universe is a, a little thin piece of glass. Uh, and the view is just, just tremendous. And your work in space involves a lot of risk, of course both for yourself and for your fellow astronauts. How do you manage 
to handle what I can only imagine is an enormous amount of stress. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I am not a daredevil, uh, believe it or not. I'm, I don't, I'm not one of these people that gets a, a, a rush from doing dangerous things. Um, as a matter of fact, I never uh, went skydiving in my life, uh, at least not on purpose, uh, until recently, just a few weeks ago. And the reason why I did that is because I'm, as part of my job at Worldview, I need to be able to learn how to fly steerable parachutes. And so the reason why I took really all the risk in my life, whether it's flying in space, it's you know fly, flying in combat uh, during Desert Storm, being an instructor at the Air Force's um, uh, Fighter Weapons School, which was a very, very dangerous job. And what all those had in common was I felt that I was making a contribution. There was a risk-benefit trade-off, and the benefit greatly outweighed weighed the risk. Um, and certainly flying in space, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have done that if I didn't feel that what we were doing was making a, a big contribution to humanity. You also had a bit of a rocky ride coming back to Earth on the Russian spacecraft. You talked about speed, the continents whizzing by, but you said it was like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel on fire. That's right, yeah. And um, it was actually scarier for the people who were watching on the ground than it was for us because during this uh, really violent, fiery, fiery ride through the atmosphere, uh, where you know we're getting thrown all over the place, and you know there's a lot of vibration, a lot of g-forces, a lot of fire, um, we actually lost contact with the ground for about 16 minutes. We we didn't even know it was happening. Um, we we fully expected that we were going to lose uh, communications for a period of time. But out the window, what I saw was initially. Well, first I saw the, the black sky of space, right? The, the, you know, the blackness of space start to turn pink. And then I started to see little sparks go by the window. And then the sparks turned into a fountain of sparks like you'd see in some fireworks displays. And the fountain of sparks turned into flames. Um, and, you know, we were, we were, like I said, whizzing by so fast. Once you get down and you get close to the earth and that speed, which is five miles a second, you know, 17,500 miles an hour, you know, when you get close to the earth, it really gives you the sense that you're you know, just at an incredible uh, speed. Let's talk about while you were in space. There must have been some downtime. I know you brought some books to read. There is not a lot of down downtime, uh, but what little downtime I had, I spent the vast, vast majority of that simply looking out the window or looking out the window with a, with a camera in my hand. And, um, you know, that people ask if I got bored up there for six months. I, I don't, I li literally do not remember a single moment being bored. And you also tweeted a lot. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing that because I wanted to share the experience with as many people as I can. It was a way to bring people along on the mission, not just as, as spectators, but as fellow crewmates. And, you know, that, that was really exciting. But, you know, when I wasn't looking out the window in, 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 spare, in our free time, uh, you know, we could watch movies together, or we could, um, we'd have meals together. Was there any food that you craved? Pizza. Yeah, Yonkers Pizza, <laughs> to be specific. <laughs> and you certainly missed your family. Oh, of course, yeah. You know, when you're in space, and actually before, as you're getting ready to go to space, you start to realize all the things that you're going to miss. You know, all the things that we normally take for granted, the breeze in your face, the sound of birds, you know, obviously contact with your friends and family and loved ones. Um, but, there, you know, there's a great deal of what defines beauty on our planet that at least for, my, for myself, I, I tended to take for granted. And when you get physically separated from the only world you've ever known, you, you grow to appreciate a lot of things a lot more. Ron, we haven't set foot on the moon in 40 years. What do you think that says about our space program? And also, what effect might that have on younger people in terms of inspiring them? Well, I could tell you what effect it had on me. Um, one of my most vivid childhood memories and the moment when I realized I wanted to be an astronaut was July 20th, 1969. And so I, you know, I was one of those millions of people as a small boy that, you know, watched those first footprints on the moon. And so my dream for my entire life was to, to be an astronaut. Uh, I think all of us have a desire and an itch, if you will, to, to see what's up beyond the next hill, to go back to the moon. I think it's really important that we go back to the moon this time to stay. This is not just so we could learn what's out there and, and increase our understanding of, of, of the world and, and the universe that we live in. Uh, it also has direct tangible benefits for us all here on the, on the surface of the Earth, and it's the, it's the absolute best investment we can make in our future. Well, coming up next, we switch gears. He arguably was not the best baseball player ever, but he was, many would argue, its most important one. A personal look at Jackie Robinson, the man who broke the color barrier.